Hi my friends and welcome to my channel. Today I am going to talk about Edward Gibbon and Georges de Verdun. A deep Anglo-Swiss friendship. I am going to briefly introduce Edward Gibbon and then we're going to look at the excerpts from Edward Gibbon's miscellaneous works. 1798. The miscellaneous works consist of letters written by Edward Gibbon to his friends, mostly to Georges de Verdun, but also to others. The ones that he wrote to Georges de Verdun are all in French, that's why I translated them into English. Here on the left you can see a portrait of Edward Gibbon when he was middle-aged. Introduction Edward Gibbon was a historian and travel writer. He was born in 1737 in Putney in England. Nowadays Putney is part of London of course, but it wasn't in 1737. His mother died when he was only 10 years old and his dad left him with his aunt who educated him. Later on, Edward Gibbon studied at Magdalen College at Oxford. Edward Gibbon did not like staying at Oxford. He thought it a massive waste of time. He was bored and idle. Soon he converted to Roman Catholicism. His father was furious and did not want, know what to do. As a Catholic, Edward Gibbon was not allowed to stay on at Oxford. His father also wanted Edward Gibbon to reconvert to Protestantism. Hence, he decided to send him to Switzerland. In fact, in the 18th century, a lot of parents sent their children to Geneva, the Calvinist stronghold in Switzerland. But Edward Gibbon's father went a step further. He thought it wise to send his son to Lausanne, as Lausanne was much smaller, quieter, less expensive than Geneva, and also very Protestant. So his father sent him to Lausanne in 1753. There Gibbon reconverted immediately to Protestantism and stayed there for five years. Why did he reconvert so fast? Lausanne, of course, was a Protestant town. Everybody was Protestant and they influenced Gibbon. His tutor was a Protestant too. And soon Edward Gibbon fell in love with Suzanne Cruchot. Suzanne Cruchot insisted further that he reconverted to Protestantism. Edward Gibbon is of course famous for the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and he was, as I said, a historian. But here we are going to look at his relationship with the Swiss and with Georges de Verdun and Suzanne Cruchot in particular. So we could say that Edward Gibbon was a grand tourist but he was a grand tourist, sui generis. In fact, he was not interested in marbles. He was not a collectionist. He did not have to leave Britain because he had to sow wild oats. He had no homosexuality trial pending. So he was not one of those exiles who went on the grand tour in order not to be prosecuted at home. He was one of those young men who had to go to Geneva to get a Protestant education. Very important for his development at Lausanne were his friendship with Jacques-Georges de Verdun and Suzanne Cruchot. Later on, after he returned to England in 1758, 
he was allowed to go on a grand tour. This grand tour even should end in Rome, the Catholic other, the capital of Catholicism. So his dad allowed him to go to Rome. During on his way to Rome, Edward Gibbon stayed again in Lausanne, only that his friend Jacques Georges de Verdun was not there. De Verdun at that time, in 1764, was in England, and soon after Edward Gibbon's grand tour, the two young men would meet. Edward Gibbon then, thanks to his friends, became a member of Parliament, but he was never, never very passionate and just stayed a backbencher, later on working for Lord North and his government. He was soon fed up with politics, wanted to focus on history and decided to go back to Lausanne and his beloved Switzerland. In fact, he stayed for a long time in Lausanne and there in De Verdun's house. He stayed there between 1783 and 1787. The two men became very, very close friends. They always ate together. They went to sleep at the same time in the afternoon, had their siesta, got up and went for a walk in the gardens. In 1789, De Verdun died and Gibbon got De Verdun's house at Lausanne. Then in 1794, Edward Gibbon died in London. He never married and he died childless. Here's a picture of Suzanne Cruchot Necker, later Necker, married Necker. Um, Suzanne Cruchot was a Protestant, a very beautiful young lady who fell in love with Edward Gibbon. But Edward Gibbon's father did not consent his son to marry Suzanne Cruchot. Edward Gibbon had to go back to London and left Cruchot there. Suzanne Cruchot promised to wait for Edward Gibbon, but later married the French finance minister Necker. When Cruchot came back later on to Switzerland for the third time in the 1780s, he met again Necker. So she was very, very important for his life. And we could say that even if Edward Gibbon was very homosocial, and we're going to look at this very, very close friendship now, we could say that he definitely had this very strong relationship with Suzanne Cruchot. And we're also going to see his relationship with younger girls later on in his life. In the 18th century, very strong male friendships where males were living together like couples were not uncommon. But if they lived abroad, then there was something strange to it because often they wanted to avoid execution for homoeroticism at home. But this, I think, is not the case with Edward Gibbon as he went to Switzerland not to escape execution, but simply to be close to his friend De Verdun. Let's have a look at all this by analysing Edward Gibbon's letters. Edward Gibbon to Georges de Verdun, London, the 20th of May, 1784. I like our sweet and perfect confidence ever so much. We love each other at a distance, and wise keeping silent. It suffices to each of us to know that we are both healthy and happy. Here we have got this, we love each other at a distance. We love each other. But here, this was not uncommon in the 18th century to write something like that about a dear friend. There is one treasure 
that I can only find at Lausanne. A friend who is agreeable to me for his feelings, his ideas, and with whom I have never experienced one instant of boredom, of conflict, or of reserve. Again, one treasure not uncommon for 18th century May friendships. Gibbon on Lausanne. Here he's really going to describe his connection to Lausanne. He was deeply in love with Lausanne. If I happened to be exiled, my choice would not be a difficult one. Lausanne saw my first steps. I am always going to remember this town with the tender memory of my youth. After 30 years, I still remember the urchins, who today are judges, and the small girls of the Société du Brinton, who today are grandmothers. Your country is enchanting, and despite my dislike for Jean-Jacques, the traditions and the spirit of its inhabitants seem to me the best choice on Lake Geneva. Unlike other grand tourists, here Gibbon actually prefers Lausanne to the cosmopolitan, fashionable and expensive Geneva. Also, he's very sui generis, very atypical, because he did not go to Switzerland as an admirer of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the Swiss philosopher, who was famous for his descriptions of the picturesque, the beautiful and the sublime. The beautiful lakes, the picturesque hills and the sublime mountains. So he did not go to Switzerland with Jean-Jacques Rousseau's La Nouvelle Héloïse in his hands. He went to Switzerland to meet the Swiss and learn more about a country with which he was deeply in love. In fact, he writes here, your country is enchanting. And despite my dislike for Jean-Jacques, he means Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So he really did not like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Jean-Jacques Rousseau had traveled to England. At the beginning, many people loved him, but then they turned against him. Nevertheless, the English who traveled to Lake Geneva, to Bienne, to Lausanne, they were normally deeply in love with Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And they went there to see the places that Jean-Jacques Rousseau mentioned in La Nouvelle Héloïse. Let's go on with his letter. Would I ever want to spend my time amidst a crowd of boys who have recently graduated from an English college? I, who would love Lausanne a hundred times more if I was the only foreigner present there? Gibbon's decision to live with his friend de Verdun in Switzerland. In the old days, during our free confessions, a hundred times we planned to live together, and a hundred times we have perused all the details of our novel with an astonishing enthusiasm. Now he lives, or you live, as I am tired of formalities, in a lovely and comfortable house. I can already see my lodgings, our communal spaces, our table and our walks. But this marriage comes to no avail if it does not suit both spouses. Here he compares his friendship to a marriage and he himself, he and, he himself and his friend de Verdun as spouses. This is admittedly a bit uncommon even for the 18th century. But it could, of course, just be a metaphor to, that he used to describe a couple who lives together. Reciprocal sentiments, Georges de Verdun to Edward Gibbon. So here we have got Georges de Verdun writing. 
both always write in French, and I tried my best to translate these letters. I could not tell you, sir and dear friend, about the manifoldness and impetuous of my sensations that your letter has caused me. All this in a context of joy and hope which will stay my heart unless you choose to chase it from there. A unique composition of circumstances gives me hope that we are meant to live together. Swiss Libraries, Edward Gibbon to Georges de Verdun, London on the 27th of June 1784. So this letter, letter was written on his, or shortly before his third stay. In fact, he is writing to Georges de Verdun when he is on his way to Switzerland. And it was very difficult for him to take his books with him. So this was his problem. As a historian, he was still writing the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, admittedly his masterpiece, even if here we are not focusing on it, it is very, very important. As I said here, we focus just on this friendship, but of course it is important to remember the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. So here he writes on the 27th of June, 1784. Unfortunately, your public library, even by adding that of Monsieur de Beauchat, is very small. But those of Bern and Baal are very large, and relying on Swiss kindness, I hope that by possessing the necessary recommendations and advertisements, I will be able to borrow the books that I absolutely need. He absolutely needs his books for his work as a historian. And here he expressively mentions Swiss kindness. He really liked the Swiss, not just his best friend, de Verdun, and his former lover, Suzanne, but the Swiss in general. Let's have a look at this accusation of homosexuality and the homosociality that was definitely there and which was a very important feature of 18th century masculine friendships. So homosexuality and machoism, Edward Gibbon to Georges de Verdun. When are you returning to Lausanne? Think that you are going to meet there a lovely little animal who nevertheless sometimes can be quite evil and who is called Milady Elizabeth Foster. Tell her about me, but only talk with discretion as she has correspondence everywhere. So they had a common friend, Elizabeth Foster, who was there and would become their common friend. So they were not just friends together, but also friends with Elizabeth Foster. They created a kind of triangle with the aim of uniting Edward Gibbon and De Verdun's friendship further. So we are going to see that Elizabeth Foster wasn't actually that important. As I said, she was just a long lady, a lovely little animal as he says, but she was important to unite these two men and to let, let these two men expand their heterosexuality, which should not go, or which they did not want, say, to border towards homosexuality. This is very clear here. Yeah, they talk about this lovely little animal, little because she was young, Maybe she was not too tall and she was lovely. She was a beautiful young lady. So this long lady unites the discourse between the two men. Gibbon's arrival in Lausanne. Letter to Lord Sheffield. Lord Sheffield is another very, very close friend to Edward Gibbon. 
it is thanks to Lord Sheffield that these miscellaneous letters were published posthumously in, nine, in 1794. And it was thanks to Lord Sheffield that at first Edward Gibbon became a member of Parliament. Only later on, Lord North helped him. I found De Verdun well and happy, but much more happy at the sight of a friend and the accomplishment of a scheme which he had so long and impatiently desired. His garden, terrace and park have been exceeded the most sanguine of my expectations and remembrances, and you yourself cannot have forgotten the charming prospect of the lake, the mountains and the declivity of the Pays de Vaux. Conquests from the Grand Tour, given to Lord Sheffield. This letter is no longer translated, as Edward Gibbon wrote in English to his friend Lord Sheffield. It is original in English without my translation. You have forgotten the old generation, and in 20 years a new one is grown up. Death has swept many from the world, and chance or choice has brought many to this place. If you inquire after your old acquaintance, Catherine, you must be told that she is solitary, ugly, blind and universally forgotten. Your later flame and our common goddess, the Eliza, passed a month at the inn. She came to consult Tissot and was acquainted with Serge. So here you see again, they are talking about women. Catherine is nothing worth anymore because she's solitary, no one wants her anymore, and that's probably because she's ugly, she's blind, she is universally forgotten. So a bit commodified, yeah? No one cares that she was a good friend, a, an old acquaintance. No, because she's ugly and she's blind, so she won't even recognise her former friends when they come along, she's solitary and universally forgotten. All those men of that coterie have forgotten her. She's nothing worth to her anymore. But then there's our common goddess, Eli Eliza. Eliza, again, is a woman that is, we could say, shared between these men. She's a common goddess and she is Lord Sheffield's flame. But she's not just his flame. She is our common goddess, and this probably includes also De Verdun, and certainly includes Tissot and Serge. Cosmopolitan Lausanne, given to his mother-in-law, Mrs. Gibbon. Edward Gibbon, after his mother's death, had an excellent relationship with his father's second wife, Mrs. Gibbon. They were very, very close friends, and if, even after his father's death, they stayed very close friends, and he wrote lots and lots of letters to her from Switzerland. So this is another letter written in English to Mrs. Gibbon, Edward Gibbon's mother-in-law. In this corner of Europe, we enjoy, or shall speedily enjoy, besides three score English, with Lady Pembroke and 40 French, with the Duchess of Sivrac at their head, Monsieur et Madame Necker, Madame Necker being, of course, Suzanne, his former flame, the Abbe Renal, the hereditary Prince of Brunswick, Prince Henry of Prussia, perhaps the Duke of Cumberland, yet I am still more content with the humble natives than with most of these illustrious names. So you've got people from, Pru from Prussia, you've got Abbe Renal, even his former flame, but he prefers the humble natives. Now, I don't know if this is a turn towards frugality and even Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whom he despised so much, since he says the humble natives, but it could just be a declaration of love towards the Swiss, who in the 18th century were mostly farmers, 
and compared to the English, were pretty humble and poor. The Tour of Switzerland, Edward Gibbon to Lady Sheffield. In the winter, Lausanne is indeed reduced to its native powers, but during the summer, it is possibly, after Spa, one of the most favourite places of general resort. The tour of Switzerland, the Alps and the glaciers is become a fashion. This so attracts the invalids, especially from France, and the colony of English have taken up the habit of spending their winter at Nice and their summers in the Bay de Vaux. Such are the splendour and variety of our summer visitors, and you will agree with me more readily than the Baron when I say that this variety, instead of being a merit, is in my opinion one of the few objections to the residence of Lausanne. He just wanted Lausanne to himself and stay there with who he called the humble Swiss. Switzerland as a sanitary resort. Dr. William Robertson to Gibbon. On the 30th of July, 1788. I hope this letter might still find you in England. When you return to Lausanne, permit me to recommend to your good offices my young son, who is now at Yverdon, on account of his health, and lives with Monsieur Hermand, a clergyman there. If you have a friend at Yverdon, be so good as to recommend him. It will do him credit to have your countenance. I have desired him to pay his respects to you at Lausanne. Here, my short lesson on Ever Gibbon and his friendship to De Verdun and his love for Switzerland comes to an end. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please subscribe to my channel and see you soon, my friends.